Right, hello, friends. We see the room filling up. We see those numbers. And today we are recording on YouTube, so be aware. Please stay muted. And we'll get started here in just a moment, right when the clock hits 11. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you all. Welcome, welcome. <clears throat> all right, let's jump in and get started. Thank you all for joining us. And just a reminder to all stay muted. We are on format, which means we can see you and we can hear you and we love that. But our cameras do not love to hear you all the time. So please stay muted. All right. Let's jump in, and I my slide keeps going forward. We are here for the event. recording in progress. Okay. Everyone, please stay no. muted. Robert, muted. Alan, you got those mutes for me? I'm I'm clicking them. Okay. Like. All right. Hi, friends. Welcome. Today we are here for part of our summer stride and celebrating Shanta Nimbark Sakharov who is a, you know, a San Francisco legend, I'm going to say. So let's go forward and with some library announcements, and then we'll turn it over for today's event. This is part of our big summer stride, and summer stride is not just for kids, it's for all ages. So do your 20 hours reading, get your iconic San Francisco Public Library tote bag with the fun art by Keilani Juanita. We want to welcome you here to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands in which we live here in our Bay Area. Our library is committed to uplifting the names of these nations with whom we live together and encourage you to learn more about first person culture and land rights. I will be sharing in the chat box a link to today's event with um, it's a big document that will have all of the library information, a reading list about Ohlone and first person culture, as well as links to Shanta and anything that comes up, I'll try and keep up as she goes along and we'll have all of those resources in one spot for you. Some quick library news, today at two o'clock, we are celebrating the amazing life and legacy of Janice Mirakitani our second San Francisco Poet Laureate and co-founder of Glide Memorial who passed um, two weeks ago now. And so the lineup of Poet Laureates is amazing that will be there. So we encourage you to all come out two o'clock today. It's gonna be a powerful one. We have some book uh, initiatives at the library. One is Total SF and this is with SF Chronicles, Peter Hartlob and Heather Knight. And August 24th, we'll be um, coming and joining Daniel Handler and Gary Kamaya. And, you know, pick up the book, The End of the Golden Gate at your local library. They are, a lot of them are going out this week, I've heard. So you should be able to get it. We also have an on the same page. This is where we encourage all of San Francisco to read the same book at the same time. It's a bi-monthly read. This July and August, we've been reading Jacqueline Woodson, Red at the Bone. And I will also put in the chat, Jacqueline Woodson was just in our virtual library on um, Thursday, and she has amazing energy. So I encourage you to watch that on YouTube and read the book and come to the book club. <clears throat> Chronicles, Mick LaSalle, a film critic. He has not had a book out in 10 years. He'll be joining us August 18th, and his book is Dream State, California in the Movies. Uh, Tuesday, August 17th, we have Meredith Esalat, and she is a teacher talking about, oh, parenting and students and teaching. Should be good. And some art. And if you're into SF history, we have SF Neon. Um, Jim, Van, Jim Van Buskirk will talk about Neon in the cinema. And then part of our jail and reentry services department, I didn't know, don't know if many of you know that we have this department, 
So we serve in our jails and we help folks with reentry. But we have the amazing Rodessa Jones talking about her art and personal transformation and the work she does in women's prisons. All right, that's it. I'm gonna pass it on to our amazing Shanta, who I know you all know her. She is the co-founder of Other Avenues Foods. And I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it right over to Celia and Shanta. Hey everyone. Um, my name is Celia Lobono Gonzalez, and I'm helping facilitate the presentation. A little context is um, I'm a current worker owner at Other Avenues Grocery Cooperative, and you will learn more about it. And I'm also involved in grassroots food system organizing in San Francisco. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing a beloved and foundational member of the San Francisco Food Cooperative Movement, Shanta Nimbark Sakharov. So Shanta grew up in a small village of India and came to upstate New York in the mid 60s for education. She was raised as a vegetarian and was disappointed with American food in college and moved uh, to San Francisco in 1973, where she found fresh food and people interested in sharing culinary tradition and engaged in food and justice issues. This food activism led to a new wave of food cooperative movement in San Francisco Bay Area, opening a cooperatively run food stores. Shanta was active in this movement since the 70s and later became a worker owner of Other Avenues, a food co-op in the Outer Sunset District, where she worked for over 35 years. Shanta is the author of Other Avenues Are Possible, uh, the Legacy of the People's Food System, a book that chronicles the rise and fall of food co-ops. Shanta has written and published three cookbooks, Flavors of India, The Ethnic Vegetarian Kitchen, Recipes uh, with Guidelines for Nutrition and Cooking Together, and a, veg a Vegetarian Co-op Cookbook. Uh, Shanta writes recipes and articles about nutrition and food politics. She gives talks about these topics and offers cooking demonstration at various public places, such as the San Francisco Public Library, Shanta teaches vegetarian cooking classes and does video presentations of some of her recipes, which can be viewed on YouTube. And in this summer stride program for the main library, Shanta was asked to describe various paths that she wore while building food communities in the San Francisco Bay Area. But since Shanta doesn't wear hats, she loves scarves. She, you will be seeing her changing a lot of colorful scarves. So I hope you enjoy. So Shanta. What motivated you to get into food community work and food cooperatives? Can you give us some background? Well, thank you, Celia. Thanks for being here. I also want to thank the San Francisco Public Library to give us the opportunity to speak about this important era. And among other things, I miss San Francisco's library during the pandemic, just like I miss the bookstores. I don't know how I could have raised my children without the help and the presence of the library. So thank you, library. Mm -hmm. So as is the custom for book reading, I'm just going to read a short passage from my book, Other Avenues Are Possible, to answer the first question that Celia asked me. So I was born in a small agrarian village in west part of India called Gujarat. And I was raised by a vegetarian Hindu family. In my village, we ate what we grew. It was all seasonal, organic, and local by default. We didn't have any other choice. Sometimes the food wasn't enough, but we shared whatever we had. We were also fortunate that my father was a temple keeper and local farmers gifted him with new crops as that was supposed to give them good luck. And my father was allowed to bring this prasad or God's leftover home. But this food also came with a lot of responsibilities. My mother had to cook extra food in no notice at all when there was a person or persons crashing at the temple because of a village had no hotel. She was a phenomenal cook. She tried to teach me how to cook when I was little, but I shied away. 
I didn't want to learn how to cook. I was some of a tomboy, as you can see in this photo, that I have my brother, my sister, and I am wearing boys' clothes. So I told my mom, I don't want to learn how to cook because I will never get married, so I don't have to learn how to cook. But little did I know that a decade later, I would come to live in a land of plenty where there wouldn't be enough food for vegetarians. So when I came to college, I moved to a dorm to live with a family and my host family had a vegetable garden. And that is where I met with some other gardener ladies and we built a small community to cook the vegetables together and better. So what motivated me or us was our need and desire to cook better and share the food. This was my first attempt in participating in how to build community around food sharing. Mm -hmm. So Dr. When and why did you come to the United States and how did you sustain your vegetarian diet and influence other people to go meatless? I came to the US in mid sixties with my brother. My brother was my mentor. He came to visit us often. And one time when he came, he said, would you like to come to the US with me? I was only 17. I was so excited. And I said, of course, yes. So I moved to New York when I was 17, but I had trouble, difficulty adjusting, first of all, I didn't speak enough English, so it was hard to communicate with people. And then there was not enough good vegetarian food. So I moved out of the dorm and lived with the family, and this was a blessing. I not only got to learn how to cook, but also a little bit about vegetarian gardening. And then I met a wonderful vegetarian Indian family that lived near my family. And they also taught me how to have cook more vegetarian food. After college, I traveled to Europe and Middle East and India all over. And there I learned different vegetarian food for different land, even like South India was so foreign to me because they cook food differently than us, the North Indians. So where I got into food movement, into vegetarian cooking was actually after coming here. Here, meaning in San Francisco, when I settled here after my travel through half of the world, I thought California would be wonderful because food is always fresh. But what I discovered here also is that people were so passionate about this so-called vegetarian movement. Back home, we didn't know we were vegetarian because we all didn't eat meat, so we didn't call each other anything. But here, people had a reason. People had a reason to be vegetarian, an ethical reason, health reason, and environmental reason. I loved it. I thought this movement was worth joining and worth studying. So I joined this movement with a passion. We also had a great leadership at the time with authors such as Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring. And we had Francis Moore Lape, who wrote Die for a Small Planet. That was our Bible to learn everything about why to be vegetarian and how world hunger was a myth and not a reality because all we had to do is grow the food properly and share the food properly. Then we had a practical guide of how to cook vegetables and grains from Laurel Robertson, this Laurel's Kitchen. These books are still my Bibles. Then also the same time when I was first moved here, I met a local author who was also a vegetarian she encouraged me to compile my recipe and expand upon them to write a book. First, I was a little bit intimidated, but then I started to write and there was no limit to how many recipes you can create. 
And as a result, my first cookbook, Flavors of India, you see, was born. And after I published that book, I started to teach cooking classes. I started to speak about vegetarianism. And to answer your question, if and how I influence people to go meatless, in my cooking classes, as well as in my book, I don't really try to convert people to vegetarianism. I simply give people tools. And I think that the best way to alter people's behavior is by providing them tools to work with, not by lecturing. So when did you start getting involved in alternative food distribution? Oh, that would be much later in the 70s. I shopped at mom and pop store when I first came to um, San Francisco. And then of course we went to the Almany farmer's market because that was the place to get fresh vegetables. But then I met an amazing group of people. They belonged to a club called Food Conspiracy. Just the name, Conspiracy, was so exciting. So I joined them. And many, many food conspiracy buying clubs were all over San Francisco Bay Area. And I was in the Hague, which was the hub for many food conspiracy neighborhood. In fact, we heard a saying that when you go to join a club and if you can't walk, then you should start another chapter of food conspiracy. Uh, so the idea was very simple. A group of people got together to buy food in bulk to make it more affordable. And then once a week, we put the food and then we divide it in somebody's garage or churches or whatnot. But getting together when we came to order the food was a big event. Not only we cooked and shared the food, but we shared a lot of ideas. People spontaneously talk about a rally, or they will talk about starting a women's group or a childcare center. So it was like homeschooling for adults. Um, and it was really great that we saved on money, but was also about saving on packaging because we believe in bulk food. There was too much excessive packaging. Sharing food and learning about food from each other was another aspect of the food conspiracy that I really enjoyed because there were a lot of things that people knew since we all came from different parts of the country and from part of the world. So like how to make yogurt, from scratch, how to make baby food that doesn't have sugar and additives, how to make tofu. I know we take all of this food gratis, Celia, for you now, there's so many variety of all of these healthy choices, but at the time, even yogurt without fillers or without starch or sugar was not easy to find. So it was great to learn from each other how to stock your pantry, how to save food and so on. Another very important aspect of food conspiracy was how we treated each other and how we govern ourselves. Because we wanted everybody to participate in this food sharing experience, but we also want to hear everybody's voice. So it was a total democracy. Cecilia, so we can't hear your questions very well. Okay, I'll speak up. Sorry Thank you. So when and how did the food conspiracy or start to open storefronts in the Bay Area? And what was your involvement in this movement? Okay, the food conspiracy started to open up stores and they were um, really many different places and they were food stores, like these guys, mm -hmm. um, this is question four, yeah. question three. Mm -hmm. When did you? 
Okay. Yeah. So when did I start getting involved? Yeah. Okay. So that was during the time when I had started to do a lot of work and I started to do a um, lot of organizing and we started to open stores. And that was something that happened later part of the 70s. And we also had a lot of people organizing various stores. And we had a lot of stores that were trying to open, but we had trouble raising money. So we had very creative solutions about food sharing, food making, food selling, having parties and making food, okay? Question four? Do you want to talk more about, um, yeah, like your, your involvement in the food, in, in the, in the people's food system? Oh, yes. Uh, so in the people's food system, I think what was really important in the people's food system is we totally rely on ourselves because we had a lot of experience from the food conspiracy, how to do that. So we had like two stores open from nickel and dime. One was in Novi Valley, other was in the Haight. And from there, we funded other stores. And how we did it is that people, the store that had opened came and helped the new stores, not only in training, but sometimes in funding with money, sometimes even showing how to cash register and so on. So we were still in a basic mode of the food conspiracy where we put as many people to work as possible, including people who shop there. So it wasn't really that unusual. Sometimes a cashier at the hate food store that I worked and volunteer we would say, hey, a delivery truck is here. So can few people from the line get out at the delivery and just help unload the food? And sure enough, people stop waiting for the cashier to cash them out and they help the delivery truck to unload. So those were this time where there was a little distinction between the shopper and the worker. And of course, we all worked on a volunteer basis and that kept the uh, prices of the food down as well as it helped the community because the food conspiracy were kind of a self-help organization. We just helped ourselves, not so much the other people. So a lot of us began to think that to serve other people as well as to serve ourselves more efficiently, it would be good to open the stores. And this kind of movement was going around other part of the country. The San Francisco Bay Area was a good example because we had a lot of food conspiracy that opened over a dozen store very fast, but there were stores like this all over the US and they were all forming little storefronts. The difference between these kind of storefronts or the cooperative was that and we call ourselves New Wave. The difference between the New Wave and the other consumer cooperatives of the previous time is that we thought that we should select the food that would be environmentally friendly, we should sell it in bulk, and we should keep the cost of the food down to help the unserved community as well as help ourselves to do this, and this was possible until the mid 70s because the rents were cheap here for people as well as for the store. So we were able to work part-time, like I volunteered twice a week, doing stocking, doing training, doing cleaning. We all did everything we took turns, right? And that way we were able to keep the cost down. But this was more than just this, where we had other involvement with the community as well, because the stores were actually more efficient and we had more free time to open other kind of co-ops, such as at the Hate Food Store, we opened or we helped to open a cooperatively run 
a bookstore. He also helped uh, collectively run a commercial free radio station. And we helped a free clinic on Hay Street, which is still going on, by the way. Similarly, the store like Rainbow and Novi Valley store have other venues and causes of their community that had to do with Latino people and gay people and so on. But again, the idea of the food conspiracy was translated into the food store that we should keep the governance of the store in our hand and not have a boss. So that was the big difference between the old style food co-op and the new wave. So these uh, food store things combusted in like very short time, like five years. We had over a dozen storefronts and about a dozen venues that supplied us with food. And some of them were services that didn't have to do with food, like childcare center. And we had a newsletter collective that wrote political article about food and recipes and so on. Now, unfortunately, the food system, or we call it people's food system, flamed out even faster than it took to build five years, which was pretty fast time without not in a funds or planning, we had made all this happen and it just flamed out very fast. So can you tell us a bit about the various food projects that you have created and or participated in while working with the people's food system? Oh, definitely. It's time to change my scarf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would need a lot of scarves and I don't know if I brought enough scarves here. So, yeah. What I did, and I'm going to use the word we, because it was all in collaboration with other people. So what I want to emphasize here that this wasn't just about getting cheap food, although the idea was in the food conspiracy to save money so we can get healthy food, at affordable prices, and the same was true with the food store that we can sell healthy food at affordable prices. It wasn't just about cheap food. It was about other actions too. A lot of them were political rallies. Some of them were community work, like you can see in this photo that we are holding a rally. This was a way back when, when we first figured out that we should have more farms, not labs to do genetical engineering. Similarly, we were demanding certain food labeling that we are still demanding. And all of those things, we join rallies and events to support these things. And in about mid eighties, I took a little break to write my second book as well as to go finish um, grad school. But even during that time, I, along with other people, continue to support all the food co-ops and I shopped there, of course, but I also told my graduate students, friends about the food co-ops, about the food co-op movement and what it meant. And some of them started to shop the nearest food co-ops. And let's see, now I'm going to go a little bit in the jump into the chronology. So you might want to switch the photo that in 2005, this is when I had already joined other avenues. At first I was a volunteer and then I became one of the worker owner. And I noticed that a lot of the people still wanted to volunteer because they didn't want the full-time responsibility of working in a food co-op. They were either retired or going to school or they had other jobs. So I thought that it'd be a good idea for now to organize the volunteer program just like you would organize a paid staff. So like be organized to first uh, interview them and place them in the area of their interest 
And my interest was in the food prepping and we had a food prep license. So I taught people how to make sandwiches, how to make salsa. And I did that for years and years. And I must have trained a few dozen people how to make salsa. So that was one of my pleasure to do that. And unfortunately, that program stopped in 2007, like a lot of the other co-ops had to stop the volunteer program. But we connected the community so well by then that in 2005, Other Avenue won the best co-op award by the San Francisco Bay Guardians leadership, which was very large at the time. So that kind of put us on the map. So then going forward, um, we also made it happen in collaborator with the community, other things such as in 2008. 2008, the building at other avenues were up for sale. And our landlord who was a really very nice man, said that uh, he would give us a deal, but as you know, everything was expensive in San Francisco by 2008, particularly commercial building. And we didn't have a million dollars in the bank then. So this was a monumental project that we decided to do is buy the building with the help of the community. And this was really fantastic because we only had three months to come up with a business plan, find people, big and small loans. So it was kind of like a quilt to make this patchwork. And we were all very busy, not just contacting people, but spreading out so that we can pay them back in increment. So we had a lot of community support, members, shoppers, even former volunteers, and other cooperatives that help us buy the building. We made it happen in the deadline that we had to do, and we paid everybody back. Some of them even didn't want it back, so we paid our dues back to people before they were due. So that was really a success story for a collaborative monumental task. Then in 2015, Next photo shows that we made solar roof on our building. Now that we own our building, this was the time we met a wonderful group of Revolve that helped us figure out how to make this happen. And it was the environmental community, not just the neighbor. And there were some neighbors and local people, shoppers who helped us. But there was a huge environmental community uh, from all over the US and from other countries that helped us make this happen. So after doing the solar roof, we also did some other changes. So we were then certified green business. Then moving forward, next photo shows that we celebrated the publication of my book, other avenues are possible. And this was again, something that we did with the community's help because I interviewed over two dozen people to write the book who helped me not just with their uh, opinion, but with photographs and with some material to look into in the history of this moment. So again, we were the ones who made this happen in collaboration of other cooperative members. So because after the volunteer program, we still wanted to continue the contact with the community, I also decided that one way we can do it is to create community events. So I would have like at least two events every month sometimes even three. And we would invite people from the community as well as the workers who gave workshop. We gave workshop on cooking classes and how to um, raise chicken even in the backyard. 
and how to compost and all those things. Community events kept us together as the next slide will show you that we also partner with San Francisco Vegetarian Society to celebrate the World Vegetarian Festival. This happens every year and we had a big presence where we had a colorful booth decorated with scarves and saris and I did a cooking demo that hundreds of people enjoyed uh, participating. Thank you so much for your contribution. <laughs> um, so what have you been doing after retirement and during COVID isolation? Oh, well, <laughs> isolation has been really tough on everybody because uh, we have to keep meeting, but soon after the retirement, we partied a lot, okay? So that was not isolation time as yet, thank God is. We partied with a big dinner and dancing and uh, another party at the co-op that was more intimate, that we invited some former volunteers. And then we were even invited by the city hall to party with the local politician because that year they decided that we were, uh, their avenue was one of the uh, best local uh, business, so some sort of a legacy award that we won that year. So it was a time for partying. But after that, you know, what happened is during the pandemic, though I was going to a lot of public places such as library, such as bookstores, such as other co-ops and food stores, and even college campuses, to do lectures, to talk to people about my books and talk to people about the sustainable food systems and so on. This all caused, because of the pandemic, I'd say about 10 of my events with the library as well as bookstores were canceled and so were other things. So it was very um, testing time for us, but I decided to continue to write write my recipe and contribute there with a local website, such as the San Francisco Beacons website. I contribute recipes once a month, such as the website of Other Avenue, such as the website of uh, another um, co-op uh, that is not open yet, but they have a wonderful website. That's the um, uh, co-op in Benicia. And I also contribute with another group called CUSA that you may be familiar with. And they do a lot of urban education and sustainable agriculture. Okay, and going forward, the one thing that I want to mention that I did do, uh, that's my last demo that you see the summer stride in 2019. But in addition to that, I, um, for one year, I made work and lunch for my favorite group of people in this other avenues worker. And I wanted to appreciate how wonderful they were during the pandemic. So this was my way of showing my appreciation for their hard work and also keeping my connection with other avenues. Yeah. Um. Can you talk to us about your book, your, your books, and where we can find them? Oh, that's my favorite scarf. Well, after all, this is a library, right? And people love libraries, people love books. Okay, so I want to show you my first book that you already saw. It doesn't look like this anymore. So my first book, Flavors of India, looks like this now. So that's the one you see there. The old one that I showed you previously had nice orange pages, but it's the same book. It's going really strong after being almost 50 years old. In fact, it has been used um, as a college curriculum for 
classes such as cultural cuisine and it's gone through several publishers and with lots of different edition. That book was kind of my own, came out of my personal need, kind of like comfort food. I was missing food from back home and I wanted to feel healthy, but also comfortable and people enjoyed it. That's when Indian food was getting popular. So the timing was right, even though I had problem publishing the book because it was vegetarian. Can you imagine being in San Francisco and having difficulty finding a publisher for vegetarian cookbook? But yeah, that was still difficult. So that is my first book. And you can get all of these books from the San Francisco Public Library, but also in the next slide, it shows you where you can purchase them. So my second book. The Ethnic Vegetarian Kitchen. Now, the Ethnic Vegetarian Kitchen came in the 80s. It's got recipes with guidelines for nutrition, specifically vegetarian nutrition. Because in the 80s, we were obsessed with nutrition, particularly vegetarians, because we were told to get the protein, you have to combine this and that, which later became not so important because we found out that if you eat well and properly, then chances are that you're getting enough protein and enough nourishment. So it's not all that important, but having that charts and information is still helpful. In addition to nutritional guideline, it has a lot of recipes that I learned during my travel. And it's all home cooking because I learned from people I met during my travel and from immigrants that I met here. My third, my third book is not a cookbook. It's the book that we have been talking about. It's a book about the San Francisco Bay Area's food cooperative. Okay, so after that, my last book is Cooking Together. And that was supposed to have been part of the other book because I wanted to do half history, half recipes, but my publisher said, nah, you are trying to crunch two books together. So I took the recipes back home. One year later, I self-published it. Again, you can find this book at other avenues, Rainbow, and at the libraries. I have one more question for you, Tom. Okay, hopefully we will have some time. Yeah. For Q and A, yeah. Okay. So my last question is, what would be your vision, and what would you like to see happen in the Bay Area food movement in the next ten years or so? All right, this is a good question because I've been thinking about this a lot, and in fact, two chapters in my book, Other Avenues Are Possible, addresses that very topic, like future vision how to sustain co-ops and so on. So I want to say first what's going on real briefly, because we are running out of time. What's going on right now is a lot and we can build on that. So right now, for instance, we have Mandala Food Co-op in Oakland. They enjoyed their 10th anniversary in 2019. They were not part of the yes, people's yes. food system. They started in 2009. And they're going strong. And in fact, they are also going to open another store or helping to open another store and they're going to expand. So that is a good story for a newbie and in a community that used to be a food desert. And we have another food co-op near Richmond area that's going to pop up in a year or so. And that is called, um, it's in Benicia, it will be in Benicia, and that is called, um, that is called um, community something, uh, Cultivate Community Food Co-op. Okay, so the Cultivate Community Food Co-op has a lot of membership and they hope to open in a year. Then we of course have success story of Rainbow to learn from. They are over 250, uh, 
worker owners, and they still managed to run in a very non-hierarchical and without boss. And that's a success story. And then we, of course, have other avenue, a smaller but as important store by the mighty ocean where we are trying to keep our mission strong as always. And so we know that these stores could do it and survive. And the book tells you how they managed to survive. There's no reason we couldn't have 10 more stores in the next 10 years. But in order for us to have this happen, it's really important for parallel movement to happen. So that is part of my vision that while we can learn a lot from these stores that manage to sustain and the stores that are trying to open, we should also focus to do other things such as affordable housing. How can we have cooperative housing that can be also affordable? We have some cooperative housing that actually started by the labor movement. And there's a few of them in San Francisco. We need more, perhaps smaller movement where we can make it possible for people to not just co-live to make it affordable, but co-own to make it. Housing should be a citizen's right, not something that we consider fancy and for the rich. Just like good and healthy organic food should be citizen's right. Similarly, I think another um, attention that we should focus on is on farmers and farm workers, because without them, we will not have good food. We will not have good organic food. So specifically small organic farmers need to be supported. They need to be supported by the government because the big agribusiness is being supported by the government. So we, the citizen should demand from our local and federal government to support organic farmers and also have some of the organic farmers to become farmer cooperative. That way, not only they can market their food together, but they can share the labor, they can share the resources, and they'll be more sustainable. Similarly, the farm workers will become farm owners and make the whole system more sustainable. So I think that the housing and farming both becoming more cooperative will automatically give doors to more food co-op. And who knows, in 10 years, Celia will write a book. Other avenues are here. Thank you. For Sasha, does anyone want to chip in? Is it just time? We have about 10 minutes left. Um, yeah, let's take some questions. You can put those in the chat box if you want. That would be great. And our YouTube friends, if you have questions too. I love how you brought it like just such a holistic approach, Shanta. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, a couple With of the questions got a little bit mixed up, but I think we, we were able to. Uh, present everything we wanted to present. Some of the questions could be answered by Celia as well. Yes, and there's so much love already in the um, the chat. Um, lots of people who've taken classes from you. Um, a librarian out there who said they had a great class with you at their Ocean View branch and miss you. Um, but questions, friends, any questions? Um, Shanta, you have not slowed down, which I think retirement, well, I don't know if that's really true retirement, but it's an awesome retirement. Um, I really love how you, you know, bringing the housing involved and like just how we could have like a, such a healthy future with housing and food and how it all is such interconnected. Yeah, and I want to add that this is happening, actually. It's not like it is not happening right now, but it's happening in a very small scale. There are some farm cooperatives that are happening all over uh, 
um, the US as well as some in Southern California. There are new food co-ops that are trying to open again more in Southern California. And similarly, there are farmers, farm workers who are becoming farmers. I love it. I love it. All right, friends, do you have any questions for Shanta? I know you do. We'll give it the give it a few few moments. And we can uh, allow some um, unmuting. I've noticed just, you know, I, on Instagram, I follow a lot of farms and a lot of there's a, a great black farm movement happening in Oakland. And I think that is pretty amazing, too. Yes. Let's see. Cultivate Community Food Co-op is out here talking about that they've had you as a an instructor. Dennis, did you want to say something? Oh, I just did, wanted to thank Shanta for the excellent talk. I enjoyed listening to her uh, again. And uh, I noticed you didn't mention your many uh, YouTube videos. Uh, if, if people want to... Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I have been doing a lot of YouTube videos since the isolation. This is my daughter's idea. She's a videographer, and we go to my backyard, which is wonderful. We cook there, and she films there. She filmed from distance, wearing a mask. And this was great because not only it shows that you can connect with the community from distance, like we, what we're doing right now, but in addition, you can show the public that you don't really need a fancy kitchen or a lot of gadgets to make uh, gourmet food. You can cook. If somebody shows you how to, even outdoor with a few um, tools. So we do have a question in your, what are your plans for your future? Oh, what are my plans for the future? Keep doing what I'm doing. I'm creating a lot of recipes and putting and sharing. You know, I like the online thing because it just doesn't require any paper and people can read and use and they can print it out if they wanted to. So I'm really enjoying doing the same thing. Um, also retirement means that you don't really have to do anything unless and when you want to do it. So I'm enjoying that too. Uh, my husband and I start with um, a cup of chai and a cup of coffee, and the contest is whoever finishes last wins. <laughs> That's fun. Um, so here's a question about food. Uh, the, the speaker associates tofu with East Asian cuisine, but is it also used equally as much in South Asian cuisine? Huh. You know, that's really interesting because when I go back to India often, and I would say just like 10 years ago, we didn't find tofu in India. And now in a small town, you can find tofu very easily. So I think that in India, it's getting more and more available than, of course, it is used in, um, uh, you know, Burmese cooking a lot. Is used um, in Sri Lankan cooking now, before it wasn't. So it's beginning to take its place because people know that some people are dairy intolerant, but some people just want to reduce dairy from their diet. Thank you. What are you having for dinner tonight? Oh, it's a good question. I don't know who's cooking, my husband or I. <laughs> we'll figure it out. We always have something in the refrigerator. I love farmer's market. That's something I forgot to say, is that one of the great movements that is going on right now, also to build a pond for farmers and for consumers, is farmer's market. There's so many of them. We only had how many farmer's market right now? There's like a few dozen between here and Berkeley and Oakland. And you can just, smell the fresh produce there. You can talk to the farmer. I am right now working on a piece uh, with a farmer that he explained to me how cumbersome it is to get a certification for organic farming, even though their farm had been um, organic before. So things like that you hear and you learn from farmers, like how do they grow food and so on. Yes, thank you for shouting out our farmer's market. We are 
beyond blessed in the Bay Area to have um, the food that we have for sure. And a big shout out to Heart of the City Farmers Market, our neighbors at the main library who are Wednesdays and Sundays. Go shop there. Um, one last question, I think. Um, well, why, why do you think that food co-ops are not as, you know, popular or as, you know, commonplace? I think that what happened in the 80s, and, you know, somebody had asked me that question last time, is like, how did the system flame out? And it didn't really flame out as fast as some people thought, even though like a lot of the venues closed down in a couple of years. Some store tried to hang in there for a number of years, and one was the Novi Valley, uh, there was an inner sunset. But the reason why they flamed out in a you know, few years, and the reason why it's difficult to have more food cooperatives, uh, one is the real estate, it's really difficult. But the second is you can find a lot of this organic food in other places, in Costco, Walmart now has organic. People don't know the difference between A, what it means for them to distribute food in huge numbers like that, B, how they treat their workers and they, people, you know, like to get food where it's convenient and cheaper. So I understand that because we all have um, concern and constraints about how much money to spend in organic food. But two big reason is that what we started got co-opted by big organization, including Amazon and Whole Foods and Trader Joe. And secondly, um, the real estate is just impossible for food co-op to have places and for food workers to live. You know, we have a lot of turnover because people can't afford to live here. You know that. Yes, we know that for sure. And, you know, speaking of those big, uh, big companies we won't name, make sure you buy your books from Green Apple or from a local, from Rainbow, from your library. Don't go Other there. Avenues, yeah. Yes, get all those books from there. We have, we are still very lucky in our Bay Area. We have 19 bookstores. So please shop at them. And, right. and, and watch out for the cultivated community. In Benicia, if you live near there, if you near, live near Richmond, uh, Vallejo, they're going to be awesome um, food co-op coming up. Cultivate Community Food Co-op. I'm going to- Cultivate, yeah. And they have a website uh, where I um, post and um, put my recipes and share my recipes with them. But they also have other um, articles about food and agriculture and so on. Yes, Paula has shared a chat link with us from one of your recipes. So that's yeah, I was going to shout out another co-op that's starting up in East Bay, um, the Deep in East Oakland. So What's it called? The Deep. The Deep. The um, Deep. Yeah, they're still, you know, in the works and finding a place and things, but they're doing what they can. I think they're working on like operating out of a shipping container and trying to wow. meet their community's needs. So. There are, you know, projects in the Bay Area, you know, moving forward. And yeah. Yeah, I also forgot to mention, there was so much to talk today, is about the Iris Mandy and their contribution to the food cooperatives in San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah. There's six of them, they're very successful, and now they feel like there's no need to open up more bakeries and pizzeria. So they opened up a construction co-op that's doing really well in a landscaping co-op. So who knows? There'll be wow, that's next. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I also love um, you know, Rainbow Grocery's idea of no bosses. What a revolutionary idea. It's I true. Love. Yeah. It kind of makes unions obsolete, right? You don't have to negotiate, you just have to work it out. Yeah. Yeah, that could be very interesting. And again, just how it's so all interconnected to like just how we live, you know, food and housing and living. Um, one thing that pandemic has has created is just a view of community taking care of community and how that could look. All right, friends, Shanta, Cecilia, thank you for being here. Cecilia, Cecilia, Celia, Celia. <laughs> 
I appreciate you both for being here today. Yes. Thanks for attending. And also the library will send you the trivia test that I made up for you. And there's an email address in there that you can send it back to me. And if you win that trivia test, oh. then I will send you my third or the fourth book for free to you, okay? But no cheating. You can't Google anything. This is all on our system. No calling other avenues, no calling Celia, no calling Rainbow, okay? Excellent. So I will be sending a follow-up email then for everybody. And a test. It's a fun test. Only okay. 10 or 11 questions. All right. We're going to have to get you back, Shanta. We have started to look into our future of booking, okay. booking in people in person again. So okay. hopefully soon. We thank you all for being here. We thank the two of you for joining us today. Alan, we thank you big time for being in our background and library community. We miss you and we love you. Have a wonderful day. Come back at two o'clock.